And the gnomes came marching in. Two by two, three by three, four by four. Oh no, we've been invaded. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for Bland Designs and the Idiot Quilter, and welcome to my weekly vlog, uh, vlog number 352 for March the 4th, 2024. So let's jump right into what I've been working on. You know I have been designing a second quilt pattern. Well, I've got the quilt top done, and I'm hoping by the end of today I will have it quilted. But here's what it's looking like so far, and I am very happy with this design. Um... I think it's bright and it's bold and it's beautiful. Um, it's not a huge quilt. It measures about 58 by 58. Uh, but the beauty of this pattern that I have designed uh, is that you can make this larger by simply adding blocks to it. So if you want something that's more rectangular, add a row to it. If you need something that's bigger, that's going to fit a queen size, add uh, a column couple of columns, a couple of rows, and it'll fit. So yeah, it would even make a great little baby quilt uh, just by reducing the number of blocks. So yeah, so it's coming along and you may wonder when the pattern will be available. It will be available in late April. I'm still refining the pattern. Um, I'm making sure that, you know, everything is there so it'll be easy enough for anybody to do. I am, uh, rating this as a confident beginner quilt okay so that's what i've been up to i've also been up to upgrading my 3d printers and printing a lot of fun things which i'm going to come to shortly but right now let's take a look at a youtube channel um i mentioned this one uh, about a week ago on stephen and walter live it's interesting um but the concept behind it is weird this is a Canadian family. They were farmers out in the west, uh, in the Midwest of Canada at one point in their lives. Uh, they moved to Ontario. They were actually, or at least the husband was, was originally from Ontario. And they now have packed up and moved to Russia. Now, those of us that live here in North America, that is not something you hear every day. People wanting to move, purposely moving to a country like Russia, given especially the situation that's going on there right now. But here's my review of the website, and it's called C Countryside Acres. This week's YouTube channel is called Countryside Acres, and we just stumbled upon it by accident. In fact, Walter discovered it. These people are, I don't know if they're crazy or very clever. I haven't figured this out yet. But basically, it's about a family from Canada who lived in Saskatchewan as farmers. Then they moved to Ontario and built a whole farm uh, from the ground up there and then decided that they hated Canada because of our, I don't know, our stand on the LGBT community or something like that. And they have eight children. So obviously they have a hobby and they have moved to Russia. And so their videos are all about their lives in Russia. And I don't know, they've uh, had some bad experiences there, but they've been told by the Russian government that those videos had to come down apparently. And uh, now they seem to be not absolutely singing the praises of Russia, but at least uh, seeing it in a more favorable light, I guess, so they don't get taken down. They have quite a following. They have over 150 or 124 thousand subscribers i just subscribed to it because it is kind of interesting in a very weird way it's like i said i can't decide whether or not these people are crazy i mean who wants to move to russia or they're very very clever you be the judge so check out countryside acres so you will find a link for Countryside Acres in the show notes below. You'll also find a link for uh, Wednesday So with Stephanie and Stephen, which starts at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Come and go as you please. There are links to all of my fellow YouTube creator friends' uh, YouTubes. So do check them out if you've never checked them out before. And there's last week's past videos. Links to all of those too. Okay, so... 
Um, oh yes, and I do want to mention that there is a link to last week's So Chatty, and in last week's So Chatty, uh, I demonstrated how to do in the hoop applique. Uh, we're at that point now in our series where we're going to be demonstrating how to do some of the different aspects of machine embroidery, things that go way beyond just putting a monogram on a towel. And this week coming up, we're going to look at something called freestanding lace, which is one of my favorite things to do as well. Everything's my favorite thing to do in machine embroidery. So if you haven't been following that series and you have an embroidery machine or you're thinking about getting one, you're going to want to check that out. Those come out on Friday. Um, so, and this week we talked about, uh, well, we were going to talk about the uh, app uh, next door, but uh, actually... We never got to that topic. We may have to save that for another week, but I am going to talk about that in a moment. But first, I'm going to show you what things are looking like outside of my, or what not really what's looking out like outside, but what the weather is supposed to be like today. Just let me get this up on my screen for you. Here we go. Currently, we are above zero. We're at four degrees uh, Celsius, which is, you know, it's still cold, but it's, not freezing, <laughs> obviously, but we're going to have a high, if you take a look at this, a high of 15 degrees C. That is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very springy weather. We are not in spring yet. We are still in the winter and, you know, tomorrow's supposed to be 15 2 then it's 9, then it's back to 10, 9, 8, 5, 6, 10, 11. They're all above zero uh, highs for the week. Um, false hope of spring because here in Canada that means nothing. We could get a big blast of cold air that's going to bring a ton of snow with it. So you're really not safe in this country until hmm, late May <laughs> in some parts. Yeah. Um, but looking ahead to our trip to Australia, right now the high uh, in Brisbane is 32 degrees C and the high in Sydney is 23. So Brisbane's a little uh, more to the north in Australia which is closer to the equator so of course you expect it to be a little bit warmer but I don't have a problem with either one of those temperatures and hopefully um, when we get over there we will be uh, into the beginning parts of spring here when we get over there they'll be at the very beginning parts of their fall. So, yeah, but it doesn't get that cold over there, even in their winter, okay? So, not worried about that at all. As far as precipita precipitation is concerned, this coming week, well, it looks like there's 35% chance of rain tomorrow. Um, today's partly cloudy. Wednesday is cloudy. Uh, Thursday is sunny. Partly cloudy Friday. And then Saturday. Of course, always on the weekends. You know that always happens on the weekends? Um, not that's a big problem for me because, you know, it's always a weekend for me uh, being retired. But for the rest of you working folk out there, you might uh, like to have nicer weather on a weekend. So there's 60% chance, looks like, of rain on Saturday and 55% chance of rain on Sunday. So, yeah, but no snow in this forecast. We shall see. We shall see. I don't trust these weather things, you know, because they're really just intelligent guesses. And sometimes they're not even that intelligent. Well, saying or speaking of intelligence or lack thereof. So what's pissing me off this week? Okay. You've probably gotten in an argument with somebody and the kind of person always has to have the last word, right? Um... There's a lot of people like that. A lot of them tend to be female. Sorry, sounds sexist, I know, but in my experience, they have been. And uh, as a man, we learn very quickly just to keep our mouth shut. I always go by the old adage, pick the mountain you want to die on, okay? Which basically means, think about it. Is it really that important you have the last word? In fact, here's a little side tip. If you really want to make somebody nuts <laughs> in an argument, don't have the last word. Just leave it. Don't walk away. Don't say something like, well, okay, you're always right, or that. Just 
look at them and say nothing. It throws them off kilter when you do that. Believe me, I have used that trick many times. And if anything, it gets them really pissed off with you too. Because, you know, you can always kind of have a comeback for what anything, any what anybody says, but there's no comeback for silence. So anyways, what got me thinking about this? Well, we've talked about this before, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this app called Nextdoor. I think it should actually be called Busybodies because these people do not have lives, I swear. They're constantly writing things like, oh, I saw a cop car go down by the street. It had its lights, lights flashing. What's going on? Does anybody know? Like, or I saw this strange guy walking through our neighborhood. Has anybody else spotted him? Is he up to no good? Or lost cat. Saw this cat walking on the side of the road. Anybody know who it belongs to? Okay. Now, the next door app. I think its intention when it was created, well, basically, I think it's pretty much run by real estate agents. I'm not really sure about that, but um, I think it's it's got some way of, of at least advertising products for people in your community and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, in some, some ways, there are some good things about it. Like, beware of, you know, a problem, like a serious problem, not a cat walking down the street. Okay, but you know, uh, porch pirates, people trying to steal your car, uh, things like that. Okay, that's a good thing. But then you've got a whole bunch of other things that I like to call entertainment. When you're bored, go to next door because you're going to find something that's going to make you laugh because of the sheer stupidity. Last night, Walter says he checks in on a regular basis. Ugh. There were people walking through a trail in our area. And they're disgusted and upset because the beavers have been chopping down the trees. Well, you know, beavers do that, don't they? <laughs> That's their thing. Uh, beavers actually eat. We looked it up. They actually eat trees, certain trees. Okay, parts of certain trees, you know, ones that are probably younger and more tender. But the main point of them chopping down trees is to build homes for themselves. They're damming up a stream so they can build a den and raise their young. Tis the time of year for that. Okay, yes, that can cause a problem if you live right next door to a stream because it'll start to flood. Okay, but beavers are beavers. Let beavers do what beavers do best. You know, leave them alone. They're really not harmful creatures. Look, it's the cycle of nature. Okay, if God hadn't wanted beavers to eat trees, he wouldn't have made them. All right. They do thin out the forest a little bit for new growth. Okay. It's all part of nature. So don't worry about the beavers. Unless they're standing at your doorstep and gnawing on your leg, I wouldn't really get that upset about the beavers. But that's the kind of thing you get on the Nextdoor app. Now, the latest one, this one created so much conversation. And I'm sorry to say that both Walter and I got a little bit involved in the conversation. And so using my advice, I said at the beginning of just pick the mountain you want to die on. Well, I didn't really apply it to this. I eventually stopped because, well, one, I wasn't going to get the last definitive word in as if there was. This woman. Okay, she parked in a strip plaza mall outside of a drugstore that's located in there. She was in a rush. She was in a hurry. Her story changes all the time, many times over. Originally, she had to park there because she had to pick up her daughter. And she was only going to be parked there for just a couple of minutes and she couldn't find any other place to park. Okay, first thing that's wrong with this is right across the street from where she parked is a parking garage that costs a dollar and a quarter an hour. And there's always room in that garage, okay? And the parking's cheap, okay? The other thing that's stupid about this is there's a great big, huge sign, uh, several of them, in the window of the store she parked in front of that says, drivers will be, this is for customers only, drivers will be towed away. And the owner of that store is very serious because he does this on a regular basis. He has his employees go out and check to see how long a car is there and to see if it belongs to somebody that's in the store. So you're taking your chances there. Well, guess what? She got a ticket. Now, 
she was talking about it. Well, this was unfair because she was parked near the sidewalk. What's that got to do with anything? She was still parked in front of his store. Just at the end of it. Um, well, she didn't see the sign. Well, are you blind? Because someone took a picture of the sign in the window. It's not a tiny little postcard size. It's a great big, huge sign. Okay. Well, I'm new to the area and I didn't know where to park. Look behind you. There's a giant green P on a big, tall, four-story, five-story building that says parking garage. Okay. So, yeah, those excuses don't work. Well, then her story starts to change. Well, I went out. I had a friend with me. Oh, your friend must be blind as well. They couldn't see the sign. Well, my friend told me, you know, oh, no, don't just ignore that. That's not a problem. Yeah, it was a problem. She did get a ticket. The ticket was $55. So the next problem, she says, she, now she changes her story. Before, she never said there was somebody else in the car with her, okay? Obviously, the other person is as stupid as she is. Um, the other thing was, she was only going to be parking there for a minute, but they went for lunch. Well, that's more than a minute. But then the story changed because she parked there because she was in a hurry. She had to pick up her daughter. But then you went for lunch, but you didn't pick up your daughter. Okay, weird. Um, then it was, I was just picking up food. But you said you were going out for lunch. Yeah. And she kept refuting this. Now, people were getting involved in the conversation and saying, oh, there were those that said, oh, this is a scam. Well, apparently it's not. According to the city we live in, their bylaws, uh, people who own private property, and this is considered private property, can issue tickets and collect them. And it also said if she didn't pay the ticket, it would be sent to a collection agency and there would be a penalty as well. And they had a picture of her driver's license and everything like that. So, you know, okay. Um, so she was in a dilemma then. Her story kept changing. I don't know whether I should pay it or not. I mean, on the one hand, is this a scam? On the other hand, well, if they send a collection agency or something like that, I don't want to be hassled. But then again, if I don't pay it, then my credit rating might go down. Um, and all this. Right. So she's getting advice from people. And it varies from don't pay it, it's a scam, to ah, uh, just give it up and cut your losses. You made a mistake. Pay up. You won't do it again. That was my advice. And Walter's too. And several other people as well. But it went on. And it went on. And it went on. And it went on. And she still hasn't stopped. With all the energy she put into bitching and complaining in, in next door for this kind of thing. About this kind of thing. She could have paid the damn ticket. Cut her losses. It's only $55. Yeah, sure, it's annoying. But she was in the wrong. She was in the wrong. So, you know, just pay it and shut up. But that isn't happening with her. So, uh, I mean, I've dismissed myself from the fray because I'm taking my own advice. It's not worth it. But it is amusing to listen to what these a-holes, and that's what they are. They're a-holes. All the wonderful professional legal advice they're giving people. None of them are lawyers. At least if they are, they didn't identify that they're such. And I don't imagine a lawyer, a decent lawyer, would even get involved in something like this. So, yeah, this is what you got. Everybody has to have the last word. Why is that? It's a control thing. It's a power thing. People need to feel superior over somebody else. They've got to feel that they know what's best for everybody else in the world. They don't. And those kind of people are very, very annoying. Now, I run into those kind of people here on my channel. Oh, yeah. They're everywhere, okay? Because, um, you know, people write comments or whatever. They feel a need to inform me further about an issue or to correct me. Constructive criticism, always welcome. Just to make yourself feel superior. No, and I, I tend to ignore those kind of comments. Um, there are lots of comments I've had on here that I don't, I deign not to have a reaction to because they're not worth my time. The ones that are, I react to and, you know, cause I consider them constructive. So basic, and there's a lot of that goes on on YouTube. I talk to my fellow creators, YouTube creators, and we all have the same stories. 
there's always somebody that has that knows more than everybody else and are not afraid to share their knowledge okay but you know i heard someone say once you know uh opinions are like assholes everybody has one mm-hmm yep and it seems like on these apps like next door that yeah there's a lot of a-holes okay let's move on to the grow lights nothing really here to show you that uh, uh is different from last week except that maybe possibly my lettuce is getting bigger so we've got to start eating more salads again uh let me just switch this over so yeah that's grow light number one you can see the lettuce looks very luscious in there and oops wrong one grow light number two you now i told you last week we're uh getting rid of everything before we go to australia so we can start fresh and you know hopefully we can eliminate the little gnat problem that we're having and of course the jungle and you can see we've got tomatoes so need to harvest some of those because they're going to become overripe soon so need to get those into the salad onions are doing well too and these poor little green pepper plants down here at the bottom um yeah they're i don't know if walter's going to leave those when we go and just see what happens when we come home maybe we'll see they're not doing all that well uh, in there. They take a long time. So what have we learned about grow lights from this whole experience? One, don't bring in plants from outside at the end of the season to keep them going under the lights because you may bring in bugs. That's how we got our little nets. Uh, two, some things are not worth growing under grow lights. Uh, tomato plants, they need a lot of space and uh, they take a long time. Uh, peppers do okay. They take a long time too. Uh, they take about three months uh, to get them to the right size, but they they do grow. And I think if you um, are constantly, when, when you get one batch going, get a second batch started. Uh, and then you can have, you know, peppers all year round that way. Onions do very, very well. Uh, they, they just grow like a weed. Uh, most of the common uh, spices... Uh, or herbs they do well too basil especially loves the grow lights does very very well and of course lettuce lots and lots of lettuce the lettuce just seems to love the grow lights now there may be other things you can plant i'm not sure we'll have to investigate it but i think basically our grow lights are going to be confined to mm, stuff stuff you're going to eat in a salad more or less so it's a salad garden that we'll have then. So as I said, when we come back from Australia, Walter's going to clean this stuff all out. And when we come back from Australia, we'll start fresh and new under there. And then it'll get close to the time when we can start getting stuff out onto the container deck in uh, or container deck, the container gardens on the deck, container pots. Yeah. Okay. So what about 3D printing? Well, Okay, you know I love it. I talk about it all the time. It is one of my hobbies. I do have a great time with it. Yes, most of the stuff I make are toys for big boys. But, you know, it brings out, someone said yesterday, the 12-year-old Stephen. Yep. Um, but it's also the whole process of making things. And I always, I learn from the 3D printers quite a bit about this technology. And this is a technology that is becoming more and more common in people's homes. And it's not it's not going to go away. Eventually, in another few years, every home will have a 3D printer that'll do things that are much more sophisticated than what I'm doing right now with half the problems with it. So, but sometimes things go terribly wrong. I'm going to show you an example of what I'm talking about. There you go. That's the hairy gnome. Yeah. What happened here, you're going to say? Well, what happened here was um, the printer was working along very nicely. Uh, and then something got shifted. And so the nozzle wasn't uh, close enough to the thing, the, to where it lays down the layers. And so there was basically air space between the nozzle tip and the model and when that happens <laughs> yeah um you get spaghetti 
or hair because the filament is just shooting out the end of the nozzle and there's nothing for it to stick to and this happened in the middle of the night because I do run my printers 24 7 and uh, this is what I woke up to the next morning I did figure out what the problem was I'm trying to remember what the problem was now but essentially um I think my filament jammed for some reason and then it unjammed and that's what we got so yeah you have things that happen like this it's kind of pretty this happens on you know on an occasion um but i bought you know a brand new printer yes so now i have four uh-huh don't judge me um the new printer i'm loving i'm absolutely loving it and i think i talked about it last week so i'm not going to go into details but the best part about that new printer is the fact that it has a self leveling bed and most of the problems you will have with a 3d printer have all to do with the first layer that's laid down on your printer that first layer has to be pretty much perfect if you want a good final product and that first layer depends upon how level the bed is the bed is that plate you see it here it says creality on it that black plate that plate is where everything starts and if it isn't level then things go horribly wrong like you see here um and they're not easy to level um now on this particular machine you're looking at right now it has a probe attached to it and that probe touches 25 different spots on that bed level before it prints and it registers the the little rises and the little valleys the peaks and the valleys of your bed beds are not perfectly flat but it's almost microscopic your naked eye will probably not pick it up but the probe does and it registers this inside its little computer brain in the printer and so when the printer is printing things out and the nozzle comes to each of these areas it knows how to self-adjust to uh for the the bar that has the hot end on it you know up and down side to side it's a very minor very minute kind of adjustment you don't even notice it doing that but it makes all the difference so once i had never had one of these that self-leveled you can buy kits but i always held off because there was some stuff you had to do computer wise on your thing and i thought mm, on your printer and i thought mm, i might wreck it and that means upgrading firmware and all that kind of stuff of course you have to do some wiring as well you have to wire into the circuit board the probe but because of the good luck i'm having with this i thought i'm going to buy one of those bed leveling kits for one of my other printers i got it i installed it it took me seven hours <laughs> to install it because i didn't know what was it doing and i was and the instructions that came with it are written in like broken english like everything it comes from china and uh their instructions leave out a few things as well so i went to youtube we do when we're having a problem we go to youtube watch several videos with people who are installing them and long story short got it installed it's working like a dream it's like having a brand new printer so i loved it so much i bought another one for the third printer and installed it it only took me five hours there's a different set of problems with that my oldest printer of the lines uh, that i have of printers i can't install one on it i would but the problem being is um i need to put in a brand new circuit board and to be honest uh the cost of a new circuit board is about a hundred dollars not a lot but when you've only paid about three hundred dollars for the printer to start with that's a third of the cost and for four hundred dollars i could buy another one of like the brand new one that i've got so for now it's i'm just keeping it as it is but i have it pretty down pat how to level it because i learned some things which i'm not going to go into here because they're very technical and they'll mean nothing to you if you don't have a 3d printer um i learned something that 
will help me to not have to level that one printer manually every time I want to print. Um, also, I invested in special plates uh, or beds for these. Uh, you know, in this picture, this black one, that's magnetic. Um, the other ones are glass. And, uh, well, they're actually a combination of glass and something else in them. Makes them very strong, but they're clipped onto a steel plate that is the part that goes back and forth underneath the print head. Um, and they're fine, but things don't stick to them all that well sometimes. Again, that has to do with bed leveling. Um, so you use a little glue stick on them. And I've been doing that for years now. Well, these new plates, you don't need glue stick. With, and in combination with the bed leveling system, not a problem. And they're so easy to get your final finished model off them. What I had to do with the other ones is usually use a scraper, a large scraper, and kind of hack at it, which wasn't very good. With these, they're flexible. So, and because they're magnetic, I just pick them up, give them a slight little bend, and presto bingo, the uh, model, the print, comes right off. In fact, in a lot of cases, I don't even have to do that. If I let it cool down uh, enough, they just sort of just pop off. So that's cool. So I did invest in one of these for each of my other printers, including the one that doesn't have the bed leveling system. So I put some money into this. None of these things are expensive, but um, when you add them all up, it was probably a couple of hundred dollars to, you know, put on a couple of bed leveling systems and buy three of these plates. I think it was a, an investment. It was well worth the money. I am so pleased with what's happening. So let me show you some of the things that I've making. Now, I've took a few pictures, but I'm going to explain these and actually show them here to you a little bit more. The thing about bed leveling is not all prints come out well if your bed isn't perfectly leveled and the ones i'm talking about are ones like if you look down in the front there's a lizard he's a flexible little guy um he's articulated and uh so let me show you what he actually looks like here he is in real life and you see look at this now, this is what's called a print-in-place model, which means this whole thing, just as you see it here, prints out, and as soon as you take it off, it basically does this. You don't have to put anything together, nothing. It's all one piece. But before I got the bed leveling systems, I really couldn't print one of these things. They would come out more as a solid block. And if I tried to sort of crack the joints they would break so yeah i made this one last night when i went to bed i put this on this articulated dragon it's called the leaf dragon because of his tail looks like a leaf but look at that now you're gonna say well yeah it's a toy yeah it is i told you 12 year old steven here okay with the toy um if you go back here i'll show you some other toys now you see these little things down here, the, the things that look like a weird looking tool or whatever, and these blocks. Well, let me show you. Here's that one thing looks like a tool. It's a grabber. But you see, it has these gears and it slides and it pulls and it opens up. This was all printed one piece. No assembly required. Came right off the build plate when it was done. And I could do this. Now, what am I going to use it for? No, I'm not using it for that. Um, I'm really not going to use it for anything. But it's fun. Like the fidget block. You've seen these kind of things, I'm sure, before. But, again, this is was printed all off in one piece. And you see it folds in different configurations around it's it's a fidget block i wish i knew some little kids because i'd make them all this stuff because they'd have a ball with, with this kind of thing actually i'm having a ball with it right now <laughs> but again thanks to the bed leveling kits 
I would not have been able to print this on my other printers without that. Um, what else can I show you that's here? All right, see these bowls? Okay, these are cool. So this was the first one that I printed. They're collapsible. Yeah, I give them a little push down, but there. Printed in place, all one piece. Yeah, cool, eh? I'm thinking of making a bunch of these to take to the Christmas retreat for people. But I also want to see if I could print a bigger one. And yes, I can. Now you have to go around and just, you just push it because these are all loose. There's no hinges or anything like that. They all work on the, like basically on pressure. So you just go around when you've got it out and you pull it up and there you go. A little bucket be great on a retreat or something like that for your scraps or things like that and then when you're done you can fold it up and put it in your bag so lots of fun now i got this one though this really wowed walter i have a picture of it up here the long thing it's a lightsaber but it's collapsible watch Ooh, Luke, I'm not your father. Or Luke, I am your father. Whatever that goes in, but... Isn't that cool? Oops, get in the shot. Yeah, all printed at one time. No assembly required. Can you tell I'm excited? Yeah, I am. I am very excited. I'm having just way too much fun. Now, let's go back to more conventional printing as well. These items, these are going to be gifts for the retreat in, at Christmas. One is the gnome mug on the left-hand side, the green thing. I would not drink out of it. I wouldn't put hot beverages in it. These, this plastic is not food grade. Okay, so you will see if you're into 3D printing or that or just getting into it, you'll see that people make cookie cutters, they make bowls and things like that. I would not let any of this stuff touch my food. Okay, um, but this would be great for holding like pens, pencils, marking tools, if you're a quilter or other little items. And of course, it's got a little gnome on it. So I had to have it right or print it. Now, the very rude thing with the pen stuck in it <laughs> on the other side, and I'm not going to say anything more about the rude part of this, is actually what it's supposed to be. It is a chameleon, and it's for holding a pen at the desk. In fact, I have one just over to the side of me right now. I love it. Works really well. But I decided to customize it with my signature gnomes, and so I added a gnome to the front of it. And I'm making a whole bunch of these in various colors. And this particular um pla pla is the filament that i'm using is a dual color so you get that shine and it looks like it changes colors depending on the way the light hits it uh, as well again i think these are really cool and are going to make nice gifts so yeah i've been having way too much fun for one person with my 3d printer oh one other thing i forgot to show you it is called, this is a test print that's very popular. It's called the to Torture Toaster. This is what it looks like. And what it does is it really shows you how um, the tolerance levels between parts, hinged parts. This was all printed in one piece on the printer. And so I was really testing my new printer to see how well it would do. And it works really well. So you see, you've got these gears on the side. They should turn and unlock and they do. And then inside you see these veins and things. There's, there isn't any extra plastic on them. Uh, this didn't have to print with something called supports. Supports are extra extraneous bits of plastic that hold certain pieces up. It didn't have to do that on, on this printer. On the other side, you have another one of these 
doors. Now, this is where it failed a little bit. And that's the whole idea, to, to, to see how well your printer will work in different situations. You see here, there's these little plastic things. They're supposed to slide up and down or pop out. Well, they don't. They're pretty much fused in there. There were three other ones here. I broke them off. So that didn't work very well, but you can see the little working gears inside here. And then of course it is a toaster. So what do toasters do? They pop up toast. So that works very well too. So overall, I'm very impressed with this machine. It is called the Creality Ender 3 version 3 KE. If you want, want to get into 3D printing, I, and, and you know you you want something that's almost plug and play like right out of the box i do recommend this printer i'm very impressed with it setup time was under 30 minutes basically there's very little you have to to screw together uh with it whereas my other creelties those took me an hour and the very first one took us three hours <laughs> to put together because we didn't know what we were doing. Um, the other ones, less time because I knew what I was doing then, but they still take over 30 minutes or so to put together uh, to get and then to get them up and running. This one, you pull out of the box, you attach a couple of pieces, plug it in. You can be printing your first print in under 15 minutes with it. And the price is reasonable. For us in Canada from Amazon, it was about $400. That's, that's okay. That's okay for that kind of printer. And as I said, it's been working beautifully. So um, it does have a couple of quirks, but I'm not going to get into those and they're not major at all. They're not, they're not a, a, a stopper uh, for this kind of thing. So yeah. Okay. So lots of fun there. So let's talk about some other kind of fun. Let's talk about wine, shall we? Australian wines. And this is part two of the Barossa Valley uh, Wineries Tour, or was it was a tour, I'm calling it a tour, but we did it ourselves. It wasn't organized when we were in Australia in uh, February of 2018. So here's part two of that video. So we've wandered off the beaten track coming down here because there's supposed to be some kind of winery within seven minutes walking distance from where we were on the main drag. We don't know if this road's taking us to it. I mean, there's a sign here that says this is a BBFM 89.1, but that's a radio station. Yeah. He's using a GPS on his phone to track this. Meanwhile, some interesting things across the street. It just looks weird because this is what it looks like on the outside. That doesn't look like what it is. No, it doesn't really look like what this one down <laughs> here. Of course, you can't see it for the trees. But no, it doesn't look like it's got a big tower-like right. thing on it. That's the same website, Nine Basedale Road. Yeah. Is this Basedale Road? Right. Well, when I do yes, it is. Yes, it is. 12A Bastille Road over there. Yeah. So. We are lost in Barasa. we we'll take a walk down there. Take a walk down there and see, explore the mystery. Remember. We have in our wallets our addresses for home. If you find our dead bodies here in a winery, send us back to Canada. Thank you. <laughs> well, that down Number the road 14. was definitely not it. Number 14. Now we're just trying to find it on the map. Bista Road. Yeah, that's the road we're on. Number 14. But well, you don't have an address for it. No. And what's it? Where's the number 14 on there? Yeah. Okay, uh, oh, did we did it show the railroad track? We came over a railroad track. Fourteen. 
Vista Road. I don't know if that's the railroad track. No, it's not the railroad track. Doesn't show a railroad track. No. Okay, that's no help. So, don't know where we are. We're lost. Now, this place looks like it could come out of a horror movie. Adam's family. These are kind of different. Like a succulent. Don't really know. Don't know if they're alive or they're dead. But they're kind of weird. Some more interesting architecture. I don't know if anybody lives in there or what. Walter's gone up the road. Well, that's it there. Glad well, we didn't go up far enough. So, we have found it. And this is it here. It looks like it's way over there. Huh. I think the entrance may be down here. Or I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Get it out. So we found this place. And this is the entrance to it, but that goes down there. But what's up here? Because that one says, please use other entrance, but it's not closed. But I wonder if what is this says tour entrance, I think. Oh. So is that where there's cellar door entrance is? Or what? We know not. Cellar door sales. If that says tour entrance, then maybe it's down there. That's well, I the probably we can walk down here. Okay. They got the gates open. Well, yeah. It's a mystery. We shall see. And here we have some of the grapes right on the vine, as you can see. Look, it's Kansas. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. Follow the gray brick road. Follow the gray brick road. Oh no, lions, tigers, and beers. Oh no, this is a winery. There wouldn't be any of that. So a little closer up. So we're going into the cellar door. Now it seems that where you, when you see the words cellar door, that means the sales area in there, probably where you can taste the wines and where you can pick them up. That's what they call it in Triumph in Canada. They do? I never noticed yeah, that. It's always called the cellar door. Oh. oh, I never realized that. Well, learn something new every day. I stand to be corrected by Walter most of the time. What's that? Gin and specials, twenty dollars a bottle. Hmm. Twelve dollars a bottle. Silver Six stone. dollars a bottle. Oh well, geez. There we go. Let's try a cheap one. 
what is it, Res Shiraz. Well, you get a cheap bottle of Shiraz. Here's a selection of their wines. Twenty six fifty, twenty five twenty, twenty fifteen, twenty two. Not bad. Ten dollars. Mm. Of course, we have no idea what they taste like. It's a liqueur Shiraz. A liqueur Shiraz. Ooh, that doesn't sound all that appealing to me, but. Oh, I am going. Okay. So we went into there and we looked around and you saw the pictures of it and everything. We didn't buy anything because, well, right now we're walking back to the car uh, with it. The other thing is Walter has to drive, so we can't do any tasting because it's bad enough You're that he has to taste. It's bad know. enough that he has to drive on the left side of the road. Yeah, well, if I get tasting it, I won't be able to tell you that you're scraping me off on the left side of the road. <laughs> yeah, right. I but I um, push you out faster. <laughs> you know, like if we were in our own country or something. Yeah, but I think we should get a few bottles of wherever we go just for something decent. Well, and okay. Then, because, I mean, we've got tonight and we've got another, like, five nights in Adelaide, so. Yeah, all right, fine. But you didn't want to get the $6 Shiraz. No, I know. <laughs> and, well, it tastes like you did. Well, well, that's because we didn't taste it. But anyways, it's interesting to see the interiors of these places. Let me just up here. Wait, you want to go up there? All right, so anyways... We have more to go. This is just our sort of our first stop because we stopped at the information center and this place was close by and it was open. But by the time we get to where are we going to go next? Jackson Tri or not Jackson Tri, that's Canadian. Um, Jacobs Creek. Yeah, let's go there. Just take a look. Just because we know Jacobs Creek. It's probably a big, huge, crappy winery, so. Yeah, more than likely. That's why they send all their shitty stuff to Canada. Yeah, sort of like Yellowtail. Yeah. But you get to see what we're seeing. So, today is all about wineries. And so that takes me to events in the past week. Uh, we had several celebrations happening this week. Uh, first of all, on Tuesday night, we had Shannon's 1,000 sub celebration. She has gone over 1,000 subscribers. Congratulations, Shannon. That is great. And if you haven't subscribed to Shannon's channel yet, why? Get over there and do it. Links in the show notes. We had a really good time at that. The Fab Five plus a few others were on her live show on the Zoom part of it. And then, of course, we had everybody in the chat uh, as well because it went, it was Zoom and it was a YouTube Live. And Stephanie also had a celebration, Stephanie of Stephanie Stitches, her 20,000 subscriber celebration. That was on Friday night. And again, the Five Fab were there. The five fab are Shannon, Stephanie, Russ, Walter, and myself. And uh, we had a really good time on there, too. And I believe both of those have been uh, rebroadcasted and posted on both Shannon's channel and on Stephanie's channel, so you can check them out. On yesterday, Sunday, we had uh, I hosted a men's so day. Only four of us there, but that's okay. Um, it's usually very small. Uh, but we got a lot of things done. I got a lot of stuff done uh, while we were there. And it's always very much fun. And for any of you men out there that uh, are on the mailing list or not on the mailing list, but you're, you know, you want to join in, we have this the first Sunday of every month, except there will not be one in April. Reason being is we'll be in Australia. Okay, so the next one won't be until May. But stay tuned, I'll announce that and have a link for it down the road. Um, speaking of down the road, just again, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Uh, that's a Saturday. That will be the Idiot Quilter Spring Retreat. More details, some preliminary details will be coming out uh, in another couple of weeks about it. And then registration will open up when we get back from Australia, which is after April the 18th. And there'll be many, many more details about all of that and how to register and 
everything for that. And it is a free event. For any of you who have never been to one of my retreats before, these are different from a pop-up so day. You have to register for these. Uh, there are guest presenters. And I've got some exciting stuff happening there. There are also prizes as well. And it's just a good time for all. But you do have to register. But the whole thing is absolutely free to you as well. So stay tuned for more details. And let's see what's coming up today. Well, I got a busy day. Like I said earlier, I've got to get things on to Lucy. I have four quilt tops that need to be quilted. They're not all going to get done today. I'm going to start, I think, with my uh, latest um, one that I've developed a pattern for because I want to get that all done before we go to Australia. And uh, yeah, and I've got some other projects to work on. Of course, I've got some things on the 3D printers. They're silent right now waiting for me to tell them what to do. They're very obedient that way. And uh, yeah, I'm expecting a phone call from my colonoscopy doctor for the follow-up consultation. Um, I'm not expecting that there's going to be anything surprising there because I did see the end result report that said they found one polyp, got rid of it, and said I didn't need to make another colonoscopy appointment for five years. So when they tell you that, it's pretty much certain that, you know, everything is fine there. But I'll be much happier once I've had the consultation and I have heard that from the doctor's mouth. Okay. So yeah, that's what's going on today. So uh, I think this was a bit of a long video because I got a little carried away talking about my 3D printer. 12 year old Stephen. Yeah. But anyways, I hope you have a great week. Stay tuned uh, this week for the next episode of Idiot Quilter and for So Chatty. And then, of course, next Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m., Stephen and Walter live. And once again, maybe we'll get to the topic we suggest that we're going to talk about, or maybe we won't. No one ever knows. Okay. Have a good one. Bye for now.